Hi. So today I'm going to be continuing work on the Seeger SC3000 that a viewer sent in for repair. Now if you haven't seen the last video, part one on this, I highly recommend you check that out first, the link is down below. Um, but the uh, TLDR or TLDW is that uh, this has suffered some physical damage, it was crushed in around this area. Um, the viewer originally sent it in because the video board, the little RGB board on the inside that converts the signal from the TMS9929 uh, video display processor chip out to composite video was broken and the transistors on board were scorching and burning up. Um, found the problem, fixed it, it was physically cracked the board uh, and some traces were broken and then we found some other physical more cracks on the main board that needed fixing as well uh, but we left it in a state where it needed a lot more repair uh, and I needed to contact the owner to let me let him know and see if he wanted it fixed and well he did so here I am to do more repair so yeah let's uh let's dive straight back into it okay we have the board my fiberglass pen and let's dive into repairing these traces. Um, so I'm going to do this a little bit differently uh, because these, except for one here, they're all data traces, they're not power traces. I'm not going to be using uh, leftover leads. What I'm going to be using is just a little, very fine, I think this is a uh, 28 gauge magnet wire. So that's what I'll be using to join these traces. And then I'm going to go over it with a bit of uh, the green mechanic uh, UV curing solder mask so and that will just give it a nice protective layer after I've scrapped all this off so yeah um, let's get going this might be boring I might end up speeding through it but uh, enjoy the show Now I'm probably fine with just leaving these solder blobs to bridge those gaps, um, but the solder will eventually crack uh, with movement. So yeah, I'm just gonna run some wires to reinforce those. And I will be running them from this end to that end not the, across the entire track. shabby except for all the dags from the thingies, the uh, cotton. Just separate these lines a bit even though they are enameled and not conductive to each other, or insulated I should say, but just to make sure. I'll just give this a quick test and then I'll um, stick those down. But hopefully that just starts working now. Of course if not it means there's something else on this board that is broken, which is entirely possible. Plug our video into the correct port this time. Our power and our video board. And finally, cartridge. Grab our pliers, moment of truth, and are we getting video? Oh, so close. Still nothing. Mm. 
that's a bugger. Something else is wrong. Obviously this is outputting no video, so pretty much the first thing that I want to test is the fact that, uh, well, are we actually getting video generated? So the way that I can do that is by looking at the video chip here and the outputs that go to the composite board. So if we have a look quickly at the schematic, uh, we can see this section right here. That's the connector between the video board and the TMS 9929A and L. Uh, so what I'm gonna be checking, this basically takes in the I, Y, the B, Y, and the Y, and then combines them over here into that composite video. So I wanna check that we're getting R, Y, B, Y, and Y. Pretty simple. So let's do it. Um, and we can just check that by checking these three, top three pins on this connector. So let's give this some power. All right, we're on and drawing, what's that? 570 milliamps, it's pretty nominal. Uh, without the power board as well, and okay. No, we're just getting a black screen, or what I'd assume is a black screen, because that's no good video. Well, what's that? We've got some plug in there. Some kind of Oh, that would be our vertical blanking. Yeah, okay, so we're getting an okay mm, kind of. There we go. All right, yeah, 50 hertz. So that's our, that's our vertical blanking. Um, but we're not getting any other video data. Yeah, these, so this is the, the B-Y. And this is the R-Y, which, yeah, they should be showing the, the components of the, the video signal and we're not seeing anything good there. Okay. Um, what about, I made this mistake before. Uh, let's check that we're generating sound because it might be not generating video, but it might be generating sound. And I know this cartridge has sound playing in the background while, while the game's playing. Um, so let's check the sound generation chip here. We're looking for uh, um, let's look at audio out for one, so it's on, I don't actually know which pin that is, but it is going to R17, and R17 is pretty obviously there, so let's just check that leg of R17. And we're just getting a constant signal, oops, so what are you? I don't know. Hmm, it's a really weird looking signal. That might be the buzz tone that you see when this does, console doesn't work. Hmm. Uh, sounds like we're just not working at all. Like the, the CPU's not firing. Um, okay, let's check now. Um, so... Yeah, let's verify that the CPU, because the CPU, none, none of these chips are actually getting really hot when it's in motion. So let's um, just verify that we're getting data on that data bus. So we are looking for pins uh, D0123456, which are 14, 15, 12, 8, so yeah, a bunch of those. But it's 7 through 8, 9, 10, missing 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Okay, so that is 40 pins, so that's 20. And uh, 10 is there, so we're looking at like here to there, that range, somewhere like that. I'll actually grab the proper schematic for that. Um, yeah, so we're looking at these pins right here. So D4356271. Right there, okay. So, just for my own viewing guide. Uh, let's power it on. Let's see what we see. So I'm going for, well, let's check the crystal first. So that's pin six. Oh yeah, I'm definitely getting a signal out of that trombone. Oh yeah, there's a good clock thing. Look at 3.57 megahertz. That's perfect. Uh, and then D4.
seven D zero looks exactly the same. So we're not getting data. I mean, we are getting data, but it's not changing. It looks like there's the same signal just on repeat, which is really odd. I'm not seeing any patterns. So it looks like it's repeating almost. Hmm. What else can we do? Check the address lines coming from the cartridge, I guess. So let's check. Uh, is that 11? Mm -hmm. mm, let's find A0. That's always a better place to start. That is pin 30, which is this side. So that's 40. Nine eight seven six five four three two one and pin thirty. So this is our A zero. So what I'll do is I'll pulse our power, and we want to look for a pattern there. No. So we're not getting data out off the cartridge because it's just. I mean, it is pulsing, which is interesting, but it's yeah, the timing is pretty bad, and it's not changing. So it's either not getting data back. Let's see what happens if we just wiggle the card around. No. Okay. Hmm. It is going up and down though. Okay, so if we look at the schematic here, that was a zero pin 30. It goes across to mode on the TMS. It also goes into the data bus into the cartridge connector. Uh, then it goes to uh, this SRAM I see here, pin eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, it looks the same. Hmm. So is the breakdown, or where's the breakdown, I guess, is the question. What happens if we boot this without the cartridge installed? Do we see the same data? So 40, 39, 38, 37, 36, 35, 34, 33, 32, 31, 30. So it looks exactly the same without the cartridge installed. So it's as if it, there is no cartridge. So let's see if we're getting a breakdown on any of those pins. So it actually looks as though, oh wow. I didn't notice that before, but that is uh, disgusting. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna clean all that flux up. <laughs> mm. Not that I expect it to, but let's see if removing that amount of flux, because remember, kids, flux isn't not non-conductive. Let's see if that made a difference. Oh, yes, it did actually. Look at that, we're getting a different <laughs> different uh, pattern on our signal now. Interesting, okay. Hmm. Cool, okay, so no difference, but uh, yeah, let's go back to where we were, which was looking for breaks. Um, okay, so we do actually have a couple of spots of corrosion. There is corrosion just all over this board. Uh, and you can see that in these little spots like there and over here and that one there. There's a couple up here as well. Now, I don't think, oh, there's some more here. Some over here, some down here. Look at all this corrosion. Totally missed that, there's more there. I might just go through and verify continuity across all of those breaks. So let's get our meter. So something else is stopping us from talking. Um, what I might do, because I've experienced the failure of these CPUs before, is I'm just going to take that CPU out and throw it in my tester and just see if it's a good CPU because 
it might just be a dud, dud CPU. Um, yeah, let's get into that. Alrighty, that should be out now. So, let's give it a gentle pry. Beauty. Okay. And then let's clean that up before we forget. Okay, so I have upgraded since uh, I did this last. <laughs> uh, and I've actually got a proper Z80 tester. I haven't hooked up a, you know, USB power plug to it yet because I'm lazy, but I just feed it five volts from the benchtop power supply. And uh, this is actually from uh, this 8-bit museum, who is the same guy that made the uh, retro chip tester. So definitely check his stuff out. It is amazing. Anyway, what I thought I'd do before I uh, tested the actual guy here is I popped the CPU out of my SC3000. This is the one that I replaced in that last video. I know this is working, so let's pop it in. Make sure that we pop it in the right way. The notch goes to the, the thing up here, the lever. Plug that in, and when we hit, hit power here, uh, we should start seeing it count in binary. Should. Oh, I got to reset. There we go. Okay, yep. Great. And there we go. This is my working CPU, and it should just count all the way up. Doing nothing but no ops. Yeah. Okay, anyway, you get the drill. So, let's pop this out, pop this guy in. So we've got our uh, notch on there. That indicates pin one, so pin one goes to the right in this. Drop that down there, turn it on. Oh, okay, so we already see that we've got a dead data line. So what happens when we reset? Uh-huh, yeah. So it does work, but that pin is not. Hmm. So that would be our um, our D0, our, our zero address line. Um, oh, okay. Now it's flashing. That's weird. Oh, that's not right at all. <laughs> There's definitely something wrong with this CPU. Yeah, so maybe it had a stuck pin and it's just unstuck while I was doing this testing because it definitely wasn't working at first uh, on that address line zero. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll clean this up and put a socket in anyway and then um, pop it back in and see what happens. Now, once we've got a socket in, we can always pop my good CPU in uh, to verify that that has actually, well, maybe if that, that would be the only problem, but uh, this system has a shared um, address bus. So all of the address pins on pretty much all the chips, you can see like A0 through A10 there, we've got A0, A1 up here, we've got the A0 on the CPU all the way up to A15. They're all connected to the same buses and then the way that the CPU determines which chip it wants to talk to at any given time is it toggles the chip select or the write enable, etc. So in this one, it's got chip select. There's a chip select, you know, up here. There's more chip select read, chip select write. So when it wants to write data to the PPI, it would put data on the D, the D0 through D7 and then pulse that chip select, and that would do its work to, you know, figure out how to input data from the um, from the, the, the peripherals. But for some reason, I don't think those signals are getting to other chips. So I don't know if maybe, let's actually check the chip select while I'm, while I'm talking about it. Let's check the chip select on the different things. So where's chip select on over well, there? On the uh, A255, it's on pin six. So that's two, three, four, five, and six. And so it does actually look like it is trying to do work on that that chip so that's fine let's check the chip select on uh, the sound chip so that's on pin 6 as well so that's this one here we got 1 2 3 4 5 and 6 uh, and 6 huh oh, that's not right that should be a much higher what do we get 1.7 volts that's not right at all Uh, what about 
right enable, which is on pin five. So that's, yeah, that's better. That's that's five volts. That's kind of what, I mean, that's a bit fuzzy, but that's what you'd expect from this guy as well. It should be sitting at five volts until it needs to write, and then that chip select line would go low. And that is CE89 driven from the, uh, the, the gate array, the MyTech chip here. So that's pin, is it? I can't actually read that. Let's have a look at the, so CE89 is pin 25. So that is 28, 27, 26, 25. Yeah, it looks terrible there. Hmm. Yeah. And as we can see, there is absolutely nothing else on that bus, on that line. It comes out of the, and into the sound chip. Maybe the sound chips. Not healthy. Let's just take a closer look at those pins on the back side. So this is also around the area where the crack was. So maybe we have some broken traces somewhere. So which connection was that? That is pin six, which is one, two, three, four, five, six. So that goes up through there. comes up to the, the this jumper here and then goes into there so hmm six it's that one there and 25 oh uh, yeah 0 0.8 it's a bit dirty on the connections there but yeah we wiggle it around we get less than one ohm so that's fine hmm Let's pop it out and see what that CE89 line looks like. It's going to be a lot of pop out this chip and see what it looks like. <laughs> kind of diagnosing. Oh yeah, that's a bit crusty. Okay, um, let's test that pin again. So no sound chip. What do we get on the CE89? Let's get our ground line in. There's our pin 25, and it's still kind of crap. That is interesting. Hmm. Hang on. Oh, that looks terrible too. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to set my trigger on the blue probe, and I'll put that to the chip select of the video here which is the uh, CSR pin 15. So where are you? Let's enable our channel two. Uh, pin 15, so this is 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15. So there we go, let's... Uh, all right, so we are constantly low. So, I mean, that's... Uh, yeah, okay. So there's, there's our problem. I didn't even look at that before. What about our uh, right strobe, which is pin 14? Also low, yes. Yeah, so the video chip is not being strobed to actually read or write video data from the CPU. So where does that come from? Um, 15, 14, they come from... The Gatorade. Uh, it doesn't bode well. Okay, and... So this is where it gets tricky because the Gatorade is a black box. Uh, there is a small explanation in here about kind of what the Gatorade does, which is, is functions to prevent reset signal chattering, blah, 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 to generate chip select signals of SRAM, SGC, and VDP, as well as to generate control signals for exterior. Yeah, so, so it comes from the CSW and CSR pins up there, which are these ones. And then they, yes, they look absolutely terrible. So yeah, that's probably going to be most of our problem right there. Mm -hmm. So why are we not getting, why are we getting bad info there? Let's turn that off again. Let's take that out once more. And let's just probe those pins because they looked terrible with the chip in there. 
Let's see if they also look terrible with the chip out. So, back on. There's our VCC. Looking at the yellow line here. There's our chip select. Yep, so they, I'd expect them to be bad. C89 CAS2. Yeah, yeah. See, these all look slightly better. <laughs> okay, there's our pin 7, 6. This will be. So that's CE ROM 2, and that looks kind of the same. Yeah, ground. And then we've got A15. So we weren't seeing activity on A15 before, but we are now. That's interesting. Okay. Uh, IOW, yep. 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 There's our refresh line that's working as before. IOR request is much better actually. Write is looking good and read is looking good. And min is very high, that's great. MREC is looking good. And NMI, non-emascable interrupt, is looking like we're interrupting. But that makes sense because this chip is supposed to interrupt. So let's pop that back and just check those last couple really quickly. Because they looked much different. So there's our non-emascable and we're suddenly up at a couple of volts. Yep. That one looks like it did before. Our NMI is okay. It's not as good as it was, but it's fine. There's our read. And our right is not pulsing anymore. I think this MyTech chip is dead. Which does not bode well. Because this is unobtainium. I think that's our problem. Well, I do have one of those. Yet again. Time to bust out my Sega. Pop it in, see what we see. Okay, now, what I've done, oh god, is I've taken the, the MyTech 2 chip out of my working SC. Um, but what I want to do before I do that is just clean out these pins. Okay, let's see what we get. Oh, okay. Well, this is different. I'm getting something now. What is that? It looks like garbage. Are we still seeing, yeah, we're still seeing that crap right signal. So that's probably not helping. Oh, actually let's double check that because I didn't have my ground connected just then. I forgot. No, it's still bad. Okay. Well, we're definitely getting something. Getting somewhere. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to pop my, uh, my tech in. Socket is terrible. I might replace that socket just because I don't really like it. Uh, okay, so this is my good one. Let's see what we see. Oh, there, there you go. Championship boxing, or champion boxing. I keep saying championship boxing. Uh, not, doesn't look terrific, but let's see if it plays into the, uh, the demo. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Um, partial success? Hmm, <laughs> it's better, but there's going to be something else wrong. Uh, yeah. Uh, honestly, at this point, um, I will probably go back to the customer and say that this may not be worth fixing because um, this might take two definitely makes a difference, and this one I'm this one I'm, is not well so because these are practically like i said before unobtainium um you really can't get one of those without getting another like it's specific to the sc3000 so you need to pick up an sc3000 uh in a different non-working state um doing any further repairs to the board 
probably not worthwhile because without that chip the whole system is useless and we can't the gate array inside there is unknown and it's yeah so uh, unfortunately I don't think this is going to be a repairer that's where I thought the story for this SA3000 would end and I haven't recorded an outro video but the fact that you're not watching that right now clearly means there's more to this story so I got back in touch with the owner um, let him know exactly what I found uh, and the fact that without the MyTech 2, this board is as good as parts. And he asked me to do a favor. He said, if I could pop my MyTech 2, my good working one, out of my system in here, and then use that to find any of the other faults on the system. And then possibly one day we can find a replacement and he would just be able to drop it in and then have a fully working system ready to go. So I said, sure, no problem. I'm happy to do the work. So I set about uh, investigating and there were a number of other trace repairs that needed to be done. No other physical damage, um, like the, the big crack, just things like basic corrosion that needed to be cleaned off, uh, bridged across, and then just solder masked over again. Um, but then the other issues on the top side of the board, so the Z80, the stuck data pin that I found earlier, um, that ended up being a much bigger problem, where I, it, it, the system exhibited a problem where if you ran it at first, it didn't work, and then it started working, and then after a little bit of time, it stopped working again, and had those graphical glitches. And that was the Z80 CPU heating up, and that pin becoming unstuck, stuck through thermal shock, I guess. I don't know. Um, but that CPU was definitely bad and needed a replacement. So I popped my replacement working one in there. Uh, and then the system just started working perfectly, except none of the joysticks and the keyboard worked. So then I looked at the 8255 uh, IC, the peripheral interface, and it didn't work either. Uh, it was the one that was all crushed from the I don't know what damage it, it took in the past, but that that IC was completely broken. Uh, one of the pins had actually sheared off right at the end. Um, I tried repairing that, but it still refused to work. So stuck my A255 in there, and then the system fully worked, and it was excellent. That's kind of where I left it. Um, I decided at that point that I would try to find some uh, replacements online for the Z80 and the A255. Uh, ordered some off AliExpress, and that takes about three weeks to get here. Um, so I had a little bit of downtime uh, until just waiting for postage. So I decided to set off and do a little bit of research on the MyTech 2. What it is, what it does, and if there's any modern replacements out there. And unfortunately, there are none. So the MyTech 2 is a gate array. So it has a number of inputs and a number of outputs. And between those inputs and outputs are just logic gates. And NAN, NOR, OR, etc. And based on certain input states, through different logics, the output states are set accordingly. But those equations are unknown. Um, because it is a custom IC, the logic for that has never been published and the source, I'm assuming, is lost to the annals of Sega history. There have been modern replacements for similar gate arrays uh, in the past, such as the GAL and the uh, Plankton for the Commodore 64 PLA, which again is just a gate array which controls based on inputs and outputs where signals go inside the Commodore 64. With that in mind I set out to do the research myself. Uh, yeah and now I have the Sega MyTech 2 modern replacement using a Xilinx CPLD, the XC9536XL uh, and this was made and all the research was done using my good MyTech 2 and a combination of my oscilloscope, uh, some logic probes and a logic analyzer, uh, reading the data sheet and just discerning, taking educated guesses based on how the data sheet explained what the, what the IC did. And there's some timing charts in there as well, showed exactly what some of the pins were doing at different system states. Um, and I also got some help off from the uh, boffins on the SMS Power Forum. I'll link the thread down below to where they helped me out when I when I got stuck on a couple of different pins, um, and which I am eternally grateful for. Now it's fully working Sega MyTech replacement. So uh, the source code, full source for this, including the full schematic of the PCB design and the Verilog uh, files that contain the, the final equations for this working one, will be available on my GitHub. And I'll post a link down below, uh, and you can make your own. But for now, I just like to go over a little bit on how this works. Um, the work that I exactly did to get there, just so you can see some of the, the work needed, and then I'll show it working. So if you want to stick around for the nerdy stuff, please do. Um, but yeah. So, 
I got to work. Uh, and one of the first things I did was look at the similar products that exist out there, such as, as I explained before, the Plankton, the Gal PLA. And the one that I specifically looked at is something that I've actually built and used in the past, uh, which is the XC PLA, which was a variant of the Dodgy PLA uh, by Disaster. So here is the original Dodgy PLA, which is, as it says on the can, a PLA replacement for C64 using the same CPLD that I used, the Xilinx XC9536XL. Having a look at this, you can see that there is a KiCad. Didn't really need that um, as I built the schematic from scratch, but what I did get it uh, base on was the HDL files, the Verilog here. So I based a lot of where I started from on this in the inputs, the outputs, having a look at how they did the logic. Um, this kind of confused me a bit as it looks like a bit of a mess to me. <laughs> I didn't really fully understand how this logic got to the final, but I didn't really understand the PLA logic either. Then I started looking at how I would actually be able to figure out the logic for the MyTech. So one of the first things I did was looked at the service manual. Um, and if we have a look here, we can see in the schematic, there's the MyTech uh, in, in the schematic. But if we dig down a little bit further, we get the pinout of the gate array and you can see there it actually goes into d definitions of what the input pins, what the output pins are. Well, it doesn't exactly say what the input and outputs are, but it just shows where the pins are. Um, and then you can also get uh, a little bit back a description of what that chip does. So I showed this already in the video, but this is the custom IC, it's gate array, and this has the functions to prevent the recent signal chattering, which is used um, there's a reset key on the keyboard and obviously it needs some debouncing to stop it the signal chattering when it tries to reset the CPU signal and from CPU signals emric read write a wire request refresh a6 a7 a14 and a15 so those are the input pins to generate the chip select signals of the SRAM the sound generation and the video display processor as well as to generate control signals for uh, the exterior ROM and DRAM so based on those definitions um, you can immediately start to guess what some of them could the output pins could be if you look at the output pins here you have uh, for example memr and memw there's an mrec that's memory request and a read and write so you'd assume when read is low and mrec is low and memory request this memory r would also be low because that's we're asking to request memory. So some of the logic equations are fairly straightforward and obvious. Some of them got a little bit tricky and weren't what they seemed. Um, there's also uh, a little, a few pages back, some uh, cartridge timing charts and these show, so this is a fetch code. This is the one that I really want, memory read and out write cycles. This shows during a memory read cycle, the address line happens, the IORQ, isn't, is not used, read goes low and emrec goes low at the same time. And at that, at that point, uh, shortly thereafter, memr goes low, which indicates the memory. And then all of these other pins do this specific timing pattern. So from this, you can kind of discern exactly what's happening with the, some of the other output signals. And yeah, so this was, this was a very, very, very big help in trying to figure out exactly where those go. Um, then I also used uh, my logic analyzer. So I built one of these. This is the Sigrock Pico. So the Sigrock is the portable cross-platform blah, 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 signal analysis software suite. So what I wanted it for was to take the inputs from the MyTech, uh, be able to piggyback off the chip while it's in system and be able to read what those inputs and outputs were doing at any given particular uh, time. Now I don't have an, a logic analyzer. Um, a good one that can measure the amount of pins that I was trying to measure here at the speed that I was trying to measure, they go thousands of dollars and I just flat out can't afford that. Um, so I went the cheap route and used the this cigarette Pico. So it is a Raspberry Pi Pico that has, I think it's 20 inputs and outputs, something like that, um, at a decent enough speed that I was able to use it quite well. And you can see if I pull up some of the logic 
dumps that I've got. So this is the startup of the basic three level three B cartridge. And you can see I've labeled the input pins here and the output pins. And these are this is the logic of how that system starts up. So from when the when you flick the switch, there's a little bit of a delay, and then everything goes crazy and you can see different patterns going along the way, reads and writes, and this was very useful in, in determining some of the other uh, logic equations. And you can see exactly where like one pin goes down, another goes up, and yeah, it's uh, a very useful tool indeed. Uh, I've got another dump here for uh, the game Load Runner, and you can see I've placed some markers as I was counting cycles and different things like that. Um, yeah, so this was a very useful tool. However, because of the freeness of the, the picker, um, it wasn't quite at the speed and some data got lost. So it wasn't, it was helpful, but it wasn't perfect. And I'd probably want a better logic analyzer to get an exact perfect recording of that. Um, but that coupled with further assistance that I got, um, let me down to being able to figure out exactly what the logic equations were and I built up a system here. So if I dive into my source code, which is up on, on GitHub, um, you can see here's the MyTech2 Verilog file and you can see I've defined the inputs and output pins. And then here is pretty much the gut that makes it work. Um, now I've gone through each individual section. Um, I've added a lot of comments because that's how I think. <laughs> um, and each of those comments for each kind of output our area um, is describing exactly what it does. So like the ones that I described earlier, the memory and the memorite. So memory and memorite are used to enable read write of the onboard SRAM. Um, and they are set low when MREC is low. And then obviously there's a read one for when read is, is strobed and when for when write is strobed. And then so forth and so on. Like IOR and IOW are used to enable read write of the PPI and CSR and CSR are rewrite of the VDP. CE89 is used to control the PSG and that's the sound generation chip, so forth and so on. Um, and then you get down into the hairy parts, which is the external ROM and, and RAM uh, control. And these ones were kind of where I got stuck. Um, I could not figure out for the life of me these equations. And this is kind of where I eventually asked for help. Now, the owner of this board actually was I was filling in the entire way along the, the, the ride here. And he was the one that actually opened this thread and asked, you know, said, hey, is anyone able to assist with that? Um, and a couple of people put their hand up. So I posted in and said, hey, I'm the guy that's doing this work. Any, any help? And we went back and forth a lot. I'll post the full thread link down below so you can read along. But at one point, I posted a screenshot and there is my test bench with the MyTech 2 my replacement one in there. Uh, this is my the Sigrock picker. So I was monitoring the signals and there's my basic three and that's the working system as it goes. And we had a little bit more back and forth while I was cleaning up and we kind of optimized the uh, the setup there. But uh, then, yeah, no, this is, this is the where it finally all came together. And I'll show you finally the uh, schematic. So it's very basic. It's really just, there's the, the CPLD. Uh, it has just input output pins. Um, they, this is the actual, the, the uh, 2.54 mil uh, pin headers with the specific pins laid out. Now I've laid those out specifically as they are on the existing MyTech. And then I've associated the pins on the CPLD with that layout specifically for the actual PCB layout, not really in any particular manner other than just for ease of layout. Um, there's some programming headers and then there's just a power regulator. So it takes the five volts in from the Seeger and regulates that down to the 3.3 volts that the CPLD needs. And then just a couple of capacitors for power cleaning. And if we switch over to the PCB design, you can see I've given it a little bit of a fancy text on top. Um, and if I swap to the top layer, I had a little bit of fun with this and doing the routing. It kind of went for like a bit of a system shock vibe where all of the, the lines kind of filter in into the middle. And then if we swap underneath, you can see the actual IC and how all the pins connect up. Um, thankfully, this is low enough speed that there's not really any worry about crosstalk between the different lines or um, 
uh, like interference or timing, things like that. It's slow enough that that doesn't seem to matter. But uh, yeah, and if we get the full 3D view, you get to see what the chip looks like. So the top, completely blank except for the pretty markings. And then if we go to the back, you can see the CPLD, the voltage regulator and those capacitors. And then there is the programming header, which is used obviously to program the CPLD with the code. But uh, yeah, that's, that's basically it. So like I said, all of that source code is available on GitHub. Um, you're able to just jump on there and have a look. I've thrown in some really basic programming instructions. I might expand this out a little bit further, but I guess if you're at the point where you'll be building your own MyTech 2, you probably don't need the instructions. Um, but feel free to drop me a line if you want some help uh, along the way. Um, it'll also be very interesting to see if anyone else can get one of these built up and tested, um, as I've only been able to test it myself. I will be giving this back to the owner with one inside, so he'll be able to test his as well and try a whole bunch of different cartridges that he's got. Um, and the more tested, the merrier. I can make little adjustments if people find different problems, so forth and so on. Let's see it in action. Here we are with the board back in place, ready to go. And I wanted to show you the MyTech, the Sega MyTech up nice and close. As you can see, I've left the top nice and flush, just the, uh, the pretty logo. This is the business side and then here is the party in back, it's the mullet of ICs right here. So this is the, the Xilinx uh, CPLD there with the uh, the voltage regulator and uh, the smoothing capacitors and some nice rounded pins. So let's get this in. Now I know this works and I've already run this before because I've actually already tried recording this a couple of times and even though I'd tested it in the past and it worked perfectly, uh, with my original prototype one, it's this one here, as soon as I went to record, it started giving me graphical glitches and it sent me down a troubleshooting spiral, during which I found the video chip had also failed. So we've got the replaced CPU already in spot, we've got the replaced 8255 already in spot, and I have popped in here a replacement uh, TMS9929 as well, because when I had a look at this chip uh, and I went to take it out in order to swap in a replacement, um, well, some of the pins, similar to the same thing that happened on the 8255, you can see here, it's the original 8255, and that pin there has disintegrated, and you can see the corrosion on all of the other pins. Well, the same thing happened with the TMS and you can just see how bad the corrosion really was. These pins practically just fell apart. So though it was working when I was earlier testing it, uh, just moving it around must have bumped some of those loose and yeah, the uh, the signals were just uh, were just getting, getting busted up. Anyway, it's all together now. We've got a good TMS, we've got a good 8255, we've got a good Xilog, and we have the modern replacement MyTech in there. So, I've also got my SC3000 uh, uh, flashcard here effectively, um, with, uh, I think the game that's loaded up at the moment is Champion Billiards. So, I like that one for testing, also elevator action, because when they start up, they get a nice Sega logo, and you get music immediately, which allows, allows me to test the, uh, uh, the sound chip one that's here as well. Nice, good system check. But yeah, let's uh, let's give it some power and uh, see what we see. Seeing a logo. Champion Billiards. I've also got my SJ300 joystick plugged into joystick port one, so I should be able to press that and we get our game. And as you can see, it works really well. Bam! I love this game, it's so much fun. Oh! Ah, nailed one. Anyway, so, there you go. My Tech 2 replacement working well. We've got input output, we've got video, we've got sound, we've got everything. Uh, the last thing to do is really just to put this back together um, and get it back to the owner. 
And I just wanted to show you a, a bit more of a close-up of the trace repair done on the back here, so you can see some down here, some down here, another one there. Lots of repair around the uh, the broken, the, the physical damage, the crack is just here, but a lot of these other pins were um, also affected. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that is a success story, um, especially for the reverse engineering of the replacement original MyTech, is the, the, uh, the dead one. Uh, and that is another system and another custom uh, IC that has been reverse engineered. And hopefully if someone else has this system with the same issue, with the, uh, the MyTech 2 not, uh, not working correctly, they'd be able to pop in a drop-in replacement. Anyway, thanks for sticking about, and I hope you enjoyed this video.